three, two, sorry. Hello, folks. Welcome to the second talk from the Physio Webinars 2022. And thank you very much for our presence here today. Uh, this event is organized by graduate students from the Physiology Graduate Program of the Institute of Bioscience from the University of Sao Paulo. This is our team. Uh, we organize three amazing talks with speakers from different countries around the world with different teams, uh, with different uh, backgrounds in physiology and physiology teams in their intersection with other areas. Please follow us to get more information in our uh, social medias. Today, we are very happy to be joined by Dr. Martin Girfa, who is a French Argentinian professor of neuroscience in Toulouse, uh, he obtained his PhD in neuroscience uh, from the University of Buenos Aires in 1990. He became an associate professor in the Free University of Berlin in Germany. After Dr. Martin moved to Toulouse, France, where he is a full professor of neuroscience. His research focused on learning and memory in insects, mainly honeybees. From behavior to molecular, he has brought a cognitive dimension to studies on insect learning and memory through his work, revealing a remarkable connect, uh, cognitive ability of honeybees. Uh, Dr. Martin Guilfa, thank you very much for your presence here today. After your talk, we have 30 minutes uh, to answer questions from the audience. Everyone can ask questions through the YouTube chat uh, they can also be in Portuguese, English, or Spanish, if you like, uh, our, and French. <laughs> oh, uh, our team will select them and send mm -hmm. them to me, and then I will pass to Dr. Martin. Uh, this event will be recorded and will be available uh, through YouTube after the transmission. I will give now uh, the word to Dr. Martin Girfa, and he will and we will all be here in the background for any technical problems. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mayara. Thanks a lot for uh, to the Physio webinar team for inviting me. Actually, it's a big pleasure to be here. And mm -hmm. actually, first of all, I share my screen and then I continue speaking. So I think you can see my screen. And uh, as I was saying, it's a big pleasure to be able to tell you about the research work we're doing here especially because you guys are in South America and South America, as you can understand, is deep in my heart. So what I would like to do today is to tell you about some of the work we have been doing on learning, memory, cognition, using this little insect that you can see here, actually the honeybee. Um, one of the, let me see if this works. Yeah. So one of the questions that, that you might ask to start with is why if you're interested in learning and memory and even in cognition, meaning by that higher order processing of information in the brain, why, why would you care about honeybees, actually? What would you care about insects? There are a couple of reasons I like to mention when I speak or when, when I try to answer this question related to honeybees. First of all, the animal you can see here, the honeybee forager, exhibits develop learning and memory capabilities in a natural context. What I mean by that is that foraging bees are flower constant. What does it mean? It means that bees or a bee that you see foraging in the field remains working on the same species. It doesn't change to another species as long as the flower species it is exploiting remains profitable in terms of nectar and pollen. Meaning by that, that bees work in a chain. They don't switch species. So only uh, if the species has no nectar or pollen, then the switch will take place. So, and the reason for this flower constancy is precisely the fact that these animals learn 
and memorize the sensory traits characterizing the flowers they are exploiting at a time. They learn the colors, they learn the odors, they learn the shape, the position space. And that is exactly what allows to come back and forth all the time to the same flower species uh, to exploit and get the food on them. And so the other reason I like to mention is that these animals are experimentally accessible, meaning by that, that you can train them. You can train them like a circus animal, if you like to say it that way, to come into the lab, to enter into specific setups or mazes to answer your questions. Uh, the animals are fully cooperative, meaning by that, that uh, as long as you provide a little drop of sugar water, which is the equivalent of nectar they are looking for, the animals will be coming all day long to the lab to get this uh, drop of sugar water and to answer your questions by solving problems in your setups. Um, another important reason is actually where the disadvantage becomes an advantage. So these animals have a relatively simple brain. I put simple, as you can see here in quotes, because we will see that it's not so simple at the end. But it is a simple brain because it's just a one cubic millimeter brain, very tiny brain. And compared to our brain, where we have 100 million, um, uh, billions of neurons, 100 billions of neurons, this is a tiny brain. There are less than one million neurons, as you can see here. Um, but this is interesting because if these brains are capable of doing sophisticated behaviors, then for someone like me who is interested to find where in the brain which circuits are responsible for this and that, it might be easy to find these circuits or these structures where you have 900,000 neurons compared to where you have 1 billion neurons, actually. And the other reason is that um, through the years, and my team has been working hard in that direction too, people have been actually able to develop invasive procedures. So ways to enter in this little black box of brain and to record neural activity by different ways and then get some kind of glimpse of what's going on there. Um, so it's possible to access to this brain that you can see here and uh, Interestingly, we have discovered that neural mechanisms that you can actually find there exhibit sometimes remarkable parallels with some that have been characterized in mammals. So that's another reason why it might be interesting to study them. Um, and the other reason for someone who is interested in cognition, not just in simple associative learning, I mean by that, not simply learning that A means reward or B means punishment, but more elaborated forms of learning, these animals actually can do that. And these forms of sophisticated learner are typical of, of honeybees, but you might not find them necessarily in other insects. People have tried, we have tried in other insect species, but the only one who is actually championing this kind of level of cognitive sophistication is the honeybee until now. So let me show you the questions that I would like to address today. So I was telling you that in natural conditions, bees learn and memorize different kinds of information. The question would be, do they exhibit just simple forms of learning? We would expect these forms of learning everywhere. Learning, as I say, that A means reward, B, punishment, in other words, simple links between events. Is this just the whole story? Or can we find in this system what we call non-elemental forms of learning, not simple links, but something more elaborated, that if you would see such a processing, for instance, in a monkey in primates, you would see, oh God, this is highly cognitive, okay? Can we find things like that in this system? Uh, a question, for instance, would be, can they solve non-linear discrimination? This is a kind of complex problem, and I will tell you later what does it mean. And specifically, we would like to understand how this kind of problem solving takes place in this little brain that you can see here. This is, by the way, a real brain. It's a 3D reconstruction using confocal microscopy. It's not a scheme. So um, at the end, I'd like to mention also some new work about the neural basis of appetitive motivation, uh, because motivation is important for learning and memory. And we have discovered some exciting things recently about this. And, um, the big question at the end is, does the bee brain allow finding or detecting circuits, neural circuits, neural architectures 
that explain cognitive processing that might bring some light about the things we do too. Um, let me just start with a couple of experiments, behavioral experiments with free flying bees. These experiments, I mean, I chose them because they somehow provide an introduction to the system and then it will totally break or, or blow your mind if you don't know this kind of, of, of problem solving because you will see which kind of creature are we facing when we do this kind of experiment. So these are experiments in which free flying animals are trained to go into the lab, enter into particular mazes to solve problems. So, um, so how do you do that? It's very simple, actually. You, you go to the hive, you place a little dish with sugar water at the hive entrance, you wait for the bees to find the sugar water, and then you move the dish to a next place when they are drinking on it, and then the bees will learn the new place, will start coming there, and so on. You move them step by step to the lab, and then they start coming to the lab. And so you can make them enter into mazes and so on, and you can ask particular questions. So the question that I'm asking here is where bees can learn relational concepts. So we know that humans have the capacity to solve problems using relational concepts, which is considered a kind of abstract thinking, abstract thought. Uh, what do we mean by relational concepts? Actually, we can solve problems uh, as say by Thomas Sentel, who is a famous uh, uh, vertebrate psychologist actually, uh, using uh, relationships. So the important thing is that you don't learn the object in itself. You don't learn that, I don't know, this is black or you don't lay that this is uh, a book or is red. Actually, you what you might learn is something on top of the object, something which is a relation linking them. For instance, I can tell you, look, these two, are different, the relationship is different. And then I may take two different objects like these and you might tell me, yeah, it's the same relationship, difference. The objects are different. The objects are not the important thing, but the relation that binds the object is what has to be extracted to solve the problem. So there are different kinds of, uh, of relationships that we can learn. For instance, the relation of sameness being the same uh, or a relation of size, larger than, smaller than, as I see, many different objects can be showed and you have to detect that the objects are not important. They may change all the time until you detect that what is giving the solution to the problem is a particular relation that could be, for instance, sameness, difference, and so on and so on. So how, how do we do, how do we ask a bee if she is able of such an abstract conceptual learning, learning a particular relationship, a conceptual relationship? So this is an old experiment we did time, uh, some time ago, which actually opened a new uh, era for us of experiments because um, we didn't, I mean, we were not expecting something so spectacular at that time. The question we ask uh, is whether bees can learn a rule, a relationship or a concept of sameness. So um, here you see how it works actually. You have a marked bee, so you can see it has a green spot on the abdomen. You mark your bee. The bee has been trained to come into the lab. Here's, for instance, collecting sugar water, uh, which is provided in this micro pipette in the middle of this image. So the animal is flying back and forth between the hive and the lab all day long. And the question we are asking here is whether these bees can solve a problem called the delay matching to sample problem. It works in the following way. Essentially, for instance, the idea is that you show to a subject an object like these scissors. The subject has just to look at the object and has, I mean, just to look at that, that's all. Then you say, okay, look, now you have two objects and now you have to choose. At the beginning, the person has no idea what is the rule bringing the solution, the right answer. But in this case, it would be the scissor. Next time I chose to the person, to my subject, this one, and after that, I show these two things, the pencil and this, uh, this object here. And again, the correct choice would be this one. And so then and at some point, the subject will discover that the rule bringing the solution is choose what has been shown to you before independently of what has been shown to you. It is not important if it was a scissor, if it was a red, is a yellow tube or whatever, there is a rule. The rule is 
choose what has been shown before to you. And so we ask actually whether bees would be able to solve this kind of particular conceptual learning. This, by the way, just to tell you the complexity of the problem, is a typical experiment that developmental psychologists do to ask uh, uh, from which age the child can solve this particular problem. Because children actually get uh, um, actually focus on the objects and do not grasp the relationship until a certain age. So that's the rule we are asking. And so this is how we did it. So the bee is trained to come into the lab and uh, she has to enter into this maze to get sugar reward. So the bee arrives and see a yellow disc with a hole in the middle. So there is no reward here, just a hole. So by entering into the maze, now the bee sees the two objects and there is a choice that it, ha it has to do. If it goes to yellow, it gets reward because yellow is what has been shown at the entrance. If it goes to blue, it's wrong choice and the bee gets expelled, loses time, has to do everything again. Great. Five minutes later, the bee is back in the lab. And now, surprisingly, the disc at the entrance is no longer yellow, but blue. Uh, and independently of the fact that it was the wrong one, now, because this is what is shown at the entrance, the bee has to go for blue. Choose what is shown to you. So when it sees yellow, it has to go to yellow. When it sees blue, it has to go to, to blue. And of course you do that taking care that the reward is not always on the same side and things like that. Okay, when the bees are more or less doing this, uh, then you have to show uh, to, the, to the bees a fully novel situation, something they never saw before, because this is what, uh, what will tell you if they are using a role which is independent of the nature of the object. So when the bees have been trained with blue, yellow, yellow, blue, and so on, they arrive and they saw these for the first time. So no colors, vertical or horizontal, uh, black and white disc. So the bees could be totally disoriented or the bees have a rule. And if they have a rule, even if this is the first time they see this, they would see vertical here and then they would go for vertical here. And if they see horizontal here, they would go for horizontal here. The experiment was done in two directions, bees trained on colors and tested with the patterns, as you can see here. And in another group of bees, we did the opposite. We trained them with the patterns and then we tested them with the colors. So this is the results of the training, okay? So you see here uh, blocks of 10 visits to the maze. So in total, 60 times the bee flying uh, between the lab and, uh, and the hive. And you see two groups, the group trained with colors, blue, blue, yellow, yellow, and so on. And the group trained with patterns, vertical, vertical, horizontal, horizontal. You can see that the end of training 60 times, which is to give you an idea, one entire day of foraging activities for the bees. These are quite good actually. So in their respective problems, so <clears throat> seven times from 10, it's not bad for a bee being correct. But now comes the critical moment. The bees trained with colors, were presented with a vertical sample or horizontal sample at the entrance, okay? And those trained with patterns were presented with a blue or uh, yellow disc at the entrance. So the bees trained with colors, when they saw vertical at the entrance for the first time, in the very first choice, they went for vertical, mostly. And if they uh, actually were presented with horizontal, they went for horizontal. The bees trained with the patterns, actually, when they were presented with the blue uh, uh, disc for the first time, they went for blue. And if they were presented with the yellow disc, they went for yellow, as you can see here. This experiment was interesting and funny, actually, because it shows that bees can learn conceptual rules, a rule based on a relationship of sameness. And that is independent of the physical nature of the stimuli, because the animals transfer the rule to stimuli that are different. I have no time to show this here, but we show in this work that they can transfer the rule, uh, not only between color and, and achromatic patterns, but also between colors and others, okay? So uh, we show also that they can learn the, the opposite rule, which is choose always the opposite to what is shown to you. They have no problems in, in learning this rule too. And, um, and actually, um, we, um, have shown since then that they are able to master many, many different relational rules, like for instance, show, uh, going always to the right of 
a certain reference or to the left of or above or below uh, of and so on. But I'm underlining this one because actually this is the one that they will use in my next example. So what I'm showing you here is that they can also learn the rule, go always to the place or to the site where you have less objects, okay? And that actually uh, was interesting because it indicated that they have a sense of number. And we did many experiments on the sense of number of bees, but I'd like to show you just one example of the sense of number of bees that will use the fact that they can learn always to go to a place where is less objects independently of the quantity that you're showing. So this is an experiment that was done by, by Scarlett Howard, a brilliant Australian postdoc actually, uh, that was in our, in, in our lab, but uh, she was working with Adrian Dyer in Australia too. And she wanted to know if bees have a notion of zero, okay? So we're speaking about zero, numeric notion of zero. So zero can be actually uh, defined uh, as simply nothing, actually. I mean, the absence of anything. It can be a little bit more elaborate if you say, okay, nothing, but nothing has meaning if there is something opposed to nothing. So zero as nothing versus something. Well, you can be even more sophisticated. If you say, no, let's go to a next level. Zero is a quantity and not any quantity, but a quantity that is at the low end of a positive series of increasing number. Zero uh, at the bottom of everything. And then you have your increasing numbers um, on top of that. Uh, of course, you can elaborate even more, but this would not be useful for animals because you, you could say that zero is a symbolic representation which requires writing using an Arabic number, this one, by the way, uh, which is used in modern mathematics. Of course, animals do not write, so this one is excluded, but what about the others? Do bees have something like a notion of zero? So Scarlett actually trained the bees uh, to enter into a Y maze. This time there is nothing at the entrance, just the hole because the problem is different. And you can see here that there is an image with three squares here and here with two squares. Scarlett knew that bees could be trained to go always to less than. So in this case, to get the reward, bees have to go to two and not to three because two less than three. So what she did is that the numbers would change all the time. Here you have two versus three, but next time it would be one versus four, three versus five and so on, changing all the time but the rule remains the same. Go always to the lower number, okay? If you want to get the reward. And the stimuli change also. So let me show you some examples of what she used. Here, for instance, you can see the two, the threes. You can see she used diamonds, she used squares, she used circles, she controlled a lot of low level cues and so on. And, but the principle was the same. So this is just a simplification of the training. Uh, she trained the animals with uh, 50 visits to the apparatus. And for instance, here you see just three, but uh, the red cross indicate just for you to know where the reward was provided. So it, it was on two and not on three. Next time it was two versus four, it was again on two. Next time it was one on one because it was, it was one versus two and so on. So the animals were trained in that way until the moment in which she decided to do a, a test with a fully new situation. In this test, she presented one, which they knew, but she presented for the first time an empty wall that was never used during the training. The question was, these animals were trained to choose always less than. Would they understand? Would they actually uh, somehow uh, conceive that the emptiness of this wall is lower than one? And she did actually the same, presenting uh, uh, the empty wall versus two, the empty wall versus three, versus four, and so on, and so on. And of course, in the test, there is no reward. There is just the two images, and she recorded what the bees chose. So this is actually the results of this experiment. First of all, the very first test, zero versus one, you see that the bees prefer the white wall, the zero wall, actually, in 60% uh, uh, of the cases, and it was significant. What happened with the animals, so zero versus two, zero versus three, and so on? Actually, you can see that they preferred even more the empty wall because the choice was even clearer to them. 
this is actually something that is characteristic of the numeric sense of humans. It is called the numerical distance effect. What does it mean? Very simple. For you, actually, it's difficult to separate 23 from 24 because they are very close to each other. However, 23 and 100, very easy to discriminate because they are very, very well separated. Same here. You see that they managed to do zero versus one, but they are not so good. However, when the distance between numbers increase, they become even better. So uh, this experiment actually uh, is very nice because it shows again the cognitive power of the system. You saw already that can learn in rules. You saw that they have a sense of number. And you see actually this, that this sense of number includes actually the concept of zero which is actually a numerosity, in other words, a number, which lies at the lower end of the numerical continuum. You saw how the performance improves actually when the numbers increase. So, um, and actually um, um, this is interesting because um, these and other experiments uh, that we published, for instance, recently, a couple of weeks ago, like this paper showed that the numeric sense of bees actually shows impressive convergence with actually the numeric sense that has been shown in vertebrates, including humans. So I chose this, these two experiments because actually, if you were not expecting something so spectacular in bees, now you have it. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys are amazing and this is why we love it. And this is why we love to work on them. But actually um, for the behavioral neurobiologists, this is what I am actually, these experiments are somehow frustrating. They are frustrating because on one hand, they show you this amazing cognitive potential, actually these, these incredible capacities, which raise a lot of questions. Actually, in, in terms of, look, this, this is a tiny ex in, uh, insect, actually one cubic millimeter brain, and look at what is possible there. So, I mean, are we really so superior at the end? Question for the audience, actually. Uh, we might be in some uh, aspects, but probably not in others, as you can see. Um, but, but the experiments are frustrating for the behavioral neurobiologists because you cannot go into the brain of a free flying animal commuting between the hive and the lab. It's not possible so far. So uh, very nice. I mean, performance is amazing. Performance is appealing. But uh, actually, we cannot access the neural circuits underlying these performances. So we need other protocols uh, to study learning, cognition, and so on. And it is important that in these protocols, animals do not move. Very important. Why? Because if the animals move, I mean, and you want to record the activity of neurons or things like that, I mean, then everything will move and your signals would be full of noise and you would not know what to do. So uh, then the question would be, is it possible to have uh, learning memory uh, performances in an animal that does not move? The answer is yes. And I'll show you now actually one example of these learning protocols with immobilized bees. So this is what we do in the lab. Many others lab do that too, which is a, a protocol in which we harness the bees individually in little tubes. You can see them here. How do you do that? Well, again, you capture your bees, you put them this time in the fridge for two, three minutes just to make them sleepy. And then while they are sleepy, you can put them in the little tubes and then you're, uh, you're safe because otherwise they would sting you and that would be painful and you don't want that. But in this case, it works very nicely. So you leave them uh, for two, three hour, hours, so they get hungry, and then you can start your experiment. The experiment that I'm showing you now, it's called the olfactory conditioning of the proboscis extension reflex. What is that? I mean, the proboscis is simply the tongue of the bee. Bee have a tongue. You don't see it because it's actually retracted, but they extend the tongue when they uh, contact, when the antennae uh, contact sucrose solution because the antennae tell them, oh, there is food around, tack, the proboscis goes out. This is an innate reflex. And so what we do here is a case of Pavlovian learning, because uh, instead of doing a bell like in Pavlov's dog and giving meat, what we will do is to deliver a neutral odorant, delivered by this machine to the bee, 
you can see the bee here, this is the head of the animal. And immediately after the odor, we will give the drop of sugar water contacting the antenna and uh, eliciting these proboscis extension reflex. So the idea is that the animal that you can see here, actually this is again the machine delivering the odors. Here, the experimenter with a toothpick which has been soaked in sucrose solution coming to contact the antennae. So the animal actually should learn that there is an association between other anticipating the arrival of sucrose solution. So other means food. That's the way it works. So here you can see my bee and you will see a red square here, which is the moment in which the odor arrives for the first time. You will see that the bee will show no particular reaction to this odor actually. But now I come with the sucrose solution and you see the extension of the proboscis, which is the innate response to food. And you see that is a response that you can record very well. Now, of course, in doing that, normally you have created the association between the odor, uh, the conditioned stimulus and the sucrose, the unconditioned stimulus. So and the proof that this is the case comes now. Now I will give just the odorant, no food. And you will see what happens. Okay, now it goes because odor means food. So protocol immobilize animal and showing learning and memory. Uh, this works very nicely and it works in an incredible fast way. Here you can see, for instance, the percentage of proboscis extension responses to an odor. Let's say odor A, and I put plus because it has been associated with reward. And you saw one trial in the movie, one association odor sugar, if you have six, actually you get typically this response. So after one trial, half of the bees have learned. And after two trials, practically all guys are at 90% level learning. So incredibly fast, if you consider that trials are separated by five to 10 minutes. And not only that, if I put the bees in an incubator, I feed them regularly, I avoid other odorants in between, and I keep them alive there for two weeks, which is the typical lifespan of a bee forager. Then I bring them back to the lab put them on the machine and say, okay, do you remember which was the order I gave you two weeks ago? The typical response that I will get is something like this, okay? So brilliant memory, excellent memory. Actually, this is why these animals are used for studies on uh, memory formation, um, molecular cascades leading to memory formation and so on. There is another advantage actually uh, uh, in the case of insect use is that the cuticula actually is just a kind of armory. You can actually cut a little window to access the brain while the animal is behaving, as you can see here. And then you can replace actually this cover and you can actually uh, fix it and the animal can leave the lab without any problem actually, because you can, it's like a, a hut that you take out and place again. I'll show you an example later. So it means by that that you can access the, the mechanism of this learning. So this is actually the circuit of olfactory learning in an insect, which is essentially the same everywhere with some differences, but I mean, the, 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 the architecture is the same. So you have actually the antennae, which is the real nose of insects. On the antennae, you have approximately 60,000 olfactory receptors that are stimulated by the appropriate molecules. And then the information about this or the other odorant will go to the brain via the antenal nerve. So here, the first processing stage is a structure uh, called the antenal lobe, which is made of glomeruli. It looks very similar to the olfactory bulb of vertebrates, showing again the convergence of, the, of these neural systems actually across species. And from there, actually, you have tracts of neurons bringing the information to higher order centers like the lateral horn, which is this diffuse structure that you can find here. And mostly actually to these huge red structures uh, called actually the mushroom bodies because of their peculiar form. They look like mushrooms actually with some imagination. So, uh, and what I would like to do now, I'm, I'm just to show you one hemisphere, just one part of the olfactory uh, brain. I'm not showing you this because these are the optic globes and we are speaking about olfactory learning now. So if we concentrate on these, this is how it looks like. So this is the antenna lobe. So you come from the antenna here and then you see the tracks going to the lateral horn and going to these huge structures called the mushroom bodies. 
And in my next experiment, I would like to concentrate on these mushroom values. So, um, because actually what I would like to show you is that uh, we will not be able to do conceptual learning experiments with these that cannot move, but we can do some experiments which are challenging and sophisticated in this kind of preparation. And then we can ask whether some brain structures are necessary for this problem solving. So the question I'd like to address now is whether bees can learn non-linear discriminations. And I will illustrate that with a particular problem called the negative patterning problem, okay? It's a complex pattern, it's a complex problem, and I'll explain why. Imagine actually that every time I show you stimulus A, you get 100 euros. Now you would be very happy, of course, and imagine also that every time I give you stimulus B, you also get 100 euros, okay? So then I tell you, guys, look, now I'm showing you two, the two stimuli at the same time, A, B, and ask you, what is your prediction? And you will probably tell me, wow, that's my lucky day, because it means that I'm supposed to get 200 euros, okay? That's what you would expect. That's the immediate prediction. Why? Because actually the immediate principle that we apply is summation, okay? A means 100, B means 100, then AB has to be 200. Well, the problem called negative pattern is a nonlinear discrimination precisely because these does not apply. So the animal should learn that A means something good, B means something good, but every time A and B are together, there is nothing, no reward. Actually, what we are asking is that the animal learns that AB is not the sum of A plus B. And this is why it's called nonlinear discrimination. The animal should learn to respond to A alone, to B alone, and to inhibit the response to AB. So the first question we had with one of my PhD students, Nina Dysik, and with a colleague in, in the University of Marburg, Har Lachnit, was whether bees could learn to solve this ambiguous discrimination. It, it, it's kind of a difficult problem because you see uh, that each stimulus has two, two values, A plus, A minus, B plus, B minus, is an ambiguous problem. So if you just look at the stimuli, per se, you're lost. You don't know what to do. You have to learn somehow that A, B is something different from A and from B and so on. So, um, and what we expect is that, of course, in blank trials, animals should not respond. When you have order A, they should respond. When they show uh, B, they should respond because of the association with reward. But when you give A, B, actually, they should not respond. That's what we would expect, uh, actually, that they learn this. Well, uh, we knew that this is a complicated, uh, this would be very complicated for bees because in their normal behavior, bees consider that a mixture of A, B includes A and B. For instance, look at this experiment. This is the, what I show you in the movie. These animals have been trained with A, B rewarded. They learn it very well, and then they respond to a B very well, of course, in a test. But if I ask them, okay, do you know, what, what do you do if I show you A alone? They also respond. And if I show you B alone, they also respond to a lower level because there is probably some summation, but they respond more to AB. So meaning that actually for them, a mixture is the sum of A and B, as you can see here, okay? So the, the negative pattern would be very hard to them in principle. And we confirmed that it would be very hard by actually doing some brain imaging and focusing on the first structure that processes odor in the brain, the antenal lobe, this part. So we do some calcium imaging, which is a way to record the activity of neurons. Basically, what we do is to stain neurons with calcium dyes. Actually, we provide fluorescent light when the neurons are active. So we actually, um, um, provide some, some of these calcium dimes at this level to record the neurons that leave the antenal lobe, these kinds of neurons here. And uh, here you see one of the results. This is just one example. This is how this structure responds 
when we provide this order, one exonode. Actually, essentially, one region of this uh, antenna lobe, one glomerulus, or one region, let's say, is activated by this order. If you provide a second order, linalol, another region is activated here, as you can see here. Uh, if you provide the two orders, you see this pattern of activation. Nice. Now, imagine that you have these two and you construct an artificial image adding pixel by pixel these two patterns. If you do this, you get this. And now you see that this corresponds to this. We did lots of statistics and lots of examples. So we know actually that the brain works in additive terms. They represent a mixture of two orders as the sum of the two components. So then we say, okay, then probably they are not able to solve the negative patterning where we ask them to inhibit these kind of processes. So, and we focus on these mushroom bodies because we knew that this is here lineal. So perhaps this would be the structure that somehow suppresses the linearity. So these structures are very nice because as you might remember, it's somehow the end of the olfactory circuit. Uh, and um, these structures have been historically associated with storage of long-term memories, olfactory memories. And they are multimodal structures. They have been associated not only with storage of uh, long-term memories, but with attention process. Uh, here you have arrival of olfactory information, uh, visual information, mechanosensory information. Uh, the neurons leave the structure are multimodal. So it's a fascinating structure because it combines information from different sensory modalities and so on. So we say, okay, well, are these structures first, can we solve a negative patterning? And second, are these structures required for solving the negative patterning? So to answer this question, we set up a procedure to block the mushroom bodies in a reversible way. What we did actually with one of my collaborators is to establish this uh, possibility, which is injecting the two mushroom bodies with a local anesthetic, which is procaine. Okay, so procaine is what your dentist use actually. And in this case, we knew or we characterized that procaine would block the voltage and uh, sodium and potassium uh, currents in these neurons. So the result would be that by injecting the procaine, the mushroom bodies would be blocked and not they would not be working during a certain time. We characterize the time window and so on. After that, the effect disappears and the bees recover the mushroom bodies. But during a while, we have the possibility of asking the bee, can you solve this problem in the absence of mushroom body? Okay. So, and this is how it works. This is what I told you before. Look, if you look well, this animal has been operated. You can see here the line of the operation. We just replaced the cover on the animal. The animal is behaving normally, as you can see. And now we will take it uh, to inject the procaine here and there. And now uh, you will see actually that we do this with micro syringes and we use this particular staining to know that the drug remains there where we want it to be. So you can see here the injection and here you see the spot actually of the drug, you can see here. Uh, and then the same on the other side. So the bee would have no available mushroom bands. When this is done, actually, we replace the cover and the animal is ready to go to the experiment, okay? So um, this is the first result. We had a group of animals inject with saline solution, so it's a control. And you can see that these animals, which had the mushroom bodies, learned to respond to A alone or to B alone. I'm just showing one curve for both. Uh, and uh, at the very beginning, they had a hard time because they were confusing this with A, B, non-rewarded. But at the end, they learned to make the difference and stopped responding to A, B minus. Now, to avoid lots of curves, I will show you just this level, the last uh, trial of my training. And this is exactly the same here. So you see that they respond to A plus B plus. This is what you see here and they inhibit the response to A, B minus, which is already a nice result because it shows that despite the complexity, despite the tendency to process this information in linear ways, they can inhibit this processing 
and learn the difference uh, in, in, in this ambiguous problem. Now, what happens with the animals that had no mushroom bodies because they were blocked with prokine? Here, they were unable to learn the difference, okay? So uh, they had no mushroom bodies and they could not solve the problem. So actually you might ar argue, oh, okay, so mushroom bodies are necessary for this. I would say, no, you need an extra control experiment. Who tells you that procaine was not just suppressing the capacity to smell or something like that? So we did an extra experiment in which we trained the bees with a simple problem, but which looked like the previous one. It only looks, but it's very simple. Look, they got A rewarded, B rewarded, and now two different orders, C and D non-rewarded. So it looks like the previous one because single orders are rewarded and a combination of two is not. But this is a piece of cake for bees because A is always good, B is always good, C is always bad, and D is always bad. No ambiguity, very simple for the bees. And you can see that the control animals injected with saline had no problem at all. Look, they are very uh, much better than before. They respond to the rewarded orders. They do not respond to the non-rewarded compound. You can see what happened with the animals that had no mushroom bites because they were blocked with protein. They also could learn the problem, meaning that there was no problem in smelling or, or olfactory sense. So, they could solve this problem, which means actually that the incapacity to learn the complex problem, the negative pattern, is related to the fact that you need the mushroom bodies for that. You need the mushroom bodies for sophisticated problem solving, but you don't need the mushroom bodies for simple problem solving. Let me tell you that the same principle applies in the human brain. So some particular regions like the hippocampus are required for certain forms of learning, but they are dispensable for other forms of learning. Of course, we are not saying that this is like the hippocampus or things like that, that would be ridiculous. But what we are saying is that the same kind of principle applies. Some structures are dedicated to solve simple problems um, uh, and other structures like the mushroom bodies would be actually necessary to solve uh, more complicated problems. I have no time to tell you actually what is exactly the mechanism, but uh, we know actually within the mushroom bodies what is the circuit that allows solving this negative patterning and this an inhibitory circuit. So anytime you have AB, there is an inhibition process that is triggered to decrease the response to AB. Okay, so uh, let me show you, uh, I think this would be the one of the last parts actually, which is uh, speaking about the appetitive motivation. I told you at the very beginning that I, I would love to show you some new results uh, on the neural basis of appetitive motivation. Uh, appetitive motivation is very important because you have seen that in all experiments, we train bees with sugar solutions, so they have to be motivated to go for sugar solution if we want them to learn, okay? So what are the neural basis of appetitive motivation? And uh, let me introduce you by telling you the way we do it. So in the human brain, uh, we have information about appetitive motivational circuits. Uh, there is in particular uh, a, a series of neural circuits that have been characterized and that are called the wanting system, actually. This is a circuit that you can see here, okay? Uh, going to the, from, uh, um, the, the, the amygdala to actually the prefrontal cortex and, and other structures and so on, uh, um, and, um, and that use dopamine to communicate and to signal the wanting or the motivational drive of a person. What does it mean? Is that when you want something, when you want to reach a specific goal, this system is activated, okay? So it's what brings you to something you want, ice cream, pizza, food, a partner, something that you would like to reach, okay, activates this dopaminergic wanting system, a system relying on, on dopamine. This is different from another sensation that reward can produce. One thing is that you want to reach the reward, and another different thing is that you like it, okay? You might like it, but you might not want to reach it at that time. 
One thing relies on other circuits actually that are not dopamine dependent and that connect these different regions here. So we know that there are circuits for liking and circuits for wanting. We know that circuits for wanting depend on dopamine actually, and this has been very well studied in humans and in mammals in general, but we had no idea about this in insects. So we knew actually um, by work done by my student Rio Tejakumala, uh, um, a brilliant Indonesian student actually, uh, he spent a lot of time characterizing the dopaminergic neurons in the bee brain. So he did a lot of neuroanatomy. And uh, so for instance, characterizing where these neurons are, this one would be here and so on. And he ended up with this crazy result because actually what you see here is the whole brain of a bee, you can see here. And these uh, orange spots are clusters of dopaminergic neurons. What do numbers mean? Simply means that here you have 80 dopaminergic neurons, 140 dopaminergic neurons, 75, and so on and so on. So as you see, there are lots of dopaminergic neurons everywhere, okay? Even here in these little clusters that you can see here, okay? So, and at that time, based on work we did before, we used to think that dopaminergic it was the brain had to indicate some punishment or some negative experiences. But when we saw this, we said, no way. I mean, we, we cannot have so many dopaminergic neurons just for one function, okay? Uh, th they might be used for other things too. And this is where actually we started thinking about um, um, actually the possibility of having a dopaminergic wanting system in bees too. And this is a work I did with, with um, uh, some colleagues and friends in the University of Fuzhou and with people in my group also. So this PhD student Ying Nan Huang actually did this wonderful work with other people. And uh, you can see here actually, and here you see the idea. So we had a bee which was trained to go to an artificial feeder, okay? So the bee uh, goes, departs from the hive, lands on the feeder, feeds, and then go back. So what Ying Nang did is to characterize, capture bees at different phases. Here when they depart, here when they land and they are empty, here when they have already fed, here when they arrive, and also when they start dancing to report the presence of food. He captured these different bees, and he used a very sophisticated HPLC system, extracting brains individually and measure the quantities of dopamine and serotonin. Serotonin was our control because we didn't expect any change related to a foraging cycle in serotonin. So we quantify dopamine and serotonin in all these phases and even in during the dance. And this is what, what he got. So either at the foot place or either in the five while they were dancing or while they were foraging, okay? So, and, and, and this is what, what he got actually. So look at this. These are nanograms per brain, per individual brain of dopamine orange or serotonin. As I told you, serotonin did not change in all the conditions. That was somehow why we expect what we expected. But look at dopamine. When they arrive at the feeder and they are landing there empty, Dopamine is very high. When they start feeding and they get the reward they were looking for, dopamine goes down. So actually, when they come looking for something, it is high. When they have obtained it, it goes down. When they go back to the hive and start dancing, the crazy thing is that dopamine also goes high, which is our way to think that during dances, they are not just telling go there or go there, but they are also somehow uh, evoking the properties of something good. They are dancing and remembering look, that was so good. Okay, the restaurant was so good that it activates again this dopaminergic system. When they end dancing, okay, dopamine goes down. And these are just some bees that were there in the hive without doing anything for a while. So we verified actually, and we saw that uh, not only when they arrive, but when they depart empty, they also have these very high levels. So, uh, and, and more specifically, we wanted to see what is dopamine doing? So you see here that we use a blocker of dopamine. We put it on the thorax, it penetrates into the bee and it blocks 
the dopamine receptors, this, uh, uh, this blocker fluphenazine. I'd like you to concentrate on fluphenazine. And you can see that here we measure how many times they flew between the hive and the, and the feeding place using different treatments. Only fluphenazine, the blocker of dopamine, decreases the frequency of foraging consistently with a decrease in motivation. Again, uh, if uh, we look at the return time, we see that these treat for fluphenazine take longer to return to the field. Again, because they are probably not so motivated. And here we measure the different parts of this flight. When they go back to the, uh, to the feeder, specific time, high feeder, and you see no change. Flufenazine, the blocker does no, nothing. Back to the, uh, to, the high, uh, to the hive, no change. So what does the, the blocker of dopamine do? It increases the time they spend in the hive. They just don't want to go out if the dopamine system has been blocked. Okay, so actually these results are showing you that uh, during the foraging cycle, there are different motivational and communication states and that dopamine actually is somehow related to the appetitive motivation of the animal. When the animal wants to reach food or report about good food, tac, dopamine is activated, showing actually this high motivation. Let me just finish with things uh, that we are doing this is now just to tell you what we are doing now. Uh, and and that uh, goes back to the frustration I mentioned before. You might remember that I told you about these experiments with free flying beats that they were very nice, but they were frustrating because you cannot go into the brain. So to go into the brain, we want to reproduce these experiments in bees in a virtual reality system. So the bee is fixed from the thorax and you can see here, and it will, presented with an artificial landscape that you can see here. And the landscape will change depending on the movement of the animals. The animals, the, the movements are recorded actually on, um, on based on the movement of the street meal. So when this object moves, it's because the animal is moving the object. So uh, it might come closer to the animal, it may go to the left, to the right, just because the animal decided that the object should come closer and so on. So you can train the animals in this system, like for instance, going to the green and not to the blue. And when you reconstruct the trajectories, actually you might see that the animals are doing something like this. This is actually a reproduction of what the animals were doing in this virtual reality based on reconstructing the trajectories that you actually record with these sensors here around the ball, around the treadmill. So, and, and doing this, we did the negative pattern, but in the visual modality. So, a rewarded, B rewarded, A, B non-rewarded, and they learn. So they prefer to go to A alone, to B alone, and they inhibit going to A, B, uh, even if there is A and B uh, there. So it works. And now what we are doing actually is to put the animals under a multi-photon microscope with the brain exposed to record the brain activity while the animals are solving the problem. Here you see, for instance, the projection of the virtual reality landscape, the bee is here, and we are recording either with imaging or using multi-electrodes, actually recording of specific neurons. And by the way, actually, if you're interested to join this project uh, and you're motivated by that, uh, write to me because actually we're looking for postdocs and things like that. So uh, final slide. So um, thanks for your patience, by the way. Uh, I wanted to show you today that the brain of a bee uh, consists of a network of circuits, neurons that you can easily address, that you can easily study, uh, a brain that produces appropriate motivational states in a way that could be considered similar to our wanting system, uh, a brain that produces plastic behavior, meaning by that learning memory and so on, but not just simple learning. We have seen very sophisticated conceptual learning. We have seen actually nonlinear discriminations and so on. So there's no way in, in, in which someone can say, say that this brain is primitive or is rudimentary. At the very beginning, I told you that the brain is simple and I say, but it's just in quotes, the word simple. They are not just associative machines. They, the neural circuits, might be considered as simple, but, but not in terms of the sophistication of performance that this brain produces. So 
as I said, we have seen conceptual form of learning, nonlinear discrimination, and so on. And actually, uh, I like to underline that we're using here non-traditional model systems in neuroscience. This is no Drosophila. We have also Drosophila in the group, of course. But Drosophila cannot solve the problems that I show you today, which means that focusing on just two, three, four models in neuroscience might actually overshadow the richness of biological solutions that is around us. And we need to look at this richness as biologists to grasp the complexity of life. Uh, and, and, and this is why it's useful to look at non-traditional models like the honeybee. So these are some of the people that did the work. Uh, I mentioned some of them, for instance, like uh, uh, Scarlett and, 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 and Gregory and so on. Well, anyhow, so thanks to webinar team for inviting me. Uh, thanks to my friend Mikhail Ncher for, for being there. And uh, well, I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks. So, um, are you listening to me very well? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, so the questions are in the chat as well. I uh, will read them. So, Otoniel Lima, question. Uh, could the recruitment techniques be applied to multiple bees species, like including in single, in single as bee? What do you think about using recruit, uh, recruitment experiments to evaluate environmental impacts in bee cognition? Yeah, so thanks, Otoniel, for your question. The first answer is yes. In fact, actually, there are two people uh, right now uh, in Ribeirão Preto, actually. Uh, one of them did his PhD with me and went back to Brazil. The other one has defended his PhD thesis yesterday. Uh, uh, and uh, he's coming to France as a postdoc, actually. So first one, Joao Aguiar, second one, Rafael Carvalho da Silva. And uh, actually some of the work they were doing in these last times, and I was trying to help them, is to establish this method for stingless bees. So you have to speak with them. And uh, well, Rafael will be leaving soon, but uh, Joao Aguiar will be staying in Ribeirão Preto. And, and he had already lots of exciting data about applying these conditioning methods, recruitment methods in stingless bees, not only in bees, they even managed to do it for wasps, for neotropical wasps. So very exciting work they are doing. So that's the first part uh, of the answer. Uh, the second question is whether uh, it could be used to evaluate environmental impacts on bee cognition. For sure, and, and there is, of course, I could not include this today. But some of the works we are doing, or we did, is uh, to uh, look at something that is very important, actually, which is brain function when the animals have been treated with pesticide. You know, you might be aware that here in Europe, it's a huge debate, actually, around pesticides. Look at the case of France. It's dramatic, actually, because we were very proud about France uh, three years ago when finally the parliament managed to actually suppress the use of neonicotinoids. Unfortunately, uh, the last year, the parliament reintroduced again the pesticides, just because they say, oh, we have a problem with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some, some, some specific, specific cultures and so on. But this is just because the lobbies are so powerful. But, and, and the argument they use is that, um, look, I mean, nothing happens if you use pesticides at sub-lethal doses. It means that if you use the right doses, nobody dies. That's the argument provided. And it's true, animals do not die. But what we show is that the animals survive, reach the adult stage, but the connectivity of the mushroom bodies that you have seen actually, and you have seen how important they are, is totally destroyed and distorted. And this is why they get lost, they, they, they do not learn well and so on. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that based on the knowledge we have, based on what we do, we will not do field experiments on pesticide because this is not our, our, our specialty, but we can do what I'm telling you. And this already provides very interesting answers about uh, the impact of pesticides. Well, um, second question. Uh, is from Pedro Fernandes. 
Does the time of the day influence uh, training? Have you observed result oh, any results? Well, that's a very good question, actually, because to be honest, uh, Pedro, uh, most of the people do not care about the time of the day. Uh, they do the experiments when they can do it. Uh, look, I mean, um, and, and, um, and it has a very deep impact. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, one of the things that was an established fact in the field of B memory is that if you just give one time order sugar, okay, you create a memory that could be there for say some minutes, one hour, a couple of hours, but then it disappears. However, if you give several times order and sugar, then you establish a memory that as you saw in my graph could last for two weeks. And so people used to say, look, bees are like, finally like humans, they need repetition to get good memories, okay? And then we started changing parameters. We decided, look, what would happen if we do the experiments at the right time? Meaning by that, for instance, right time means many things, not just your question. So we are doing experiments in summer, but sometimes some days in summer are very, I mean, I mean, cloudy, not nice. So let's stop doing experiments during that time. Let's stop doing experiments rather during the evening because, or, or late at night, uh, at, during the day, because bees are supposed to go back. Well, we started changing things like that to put the learning in the most similar natural conditions. It changed everything because actually then we saw that these very long memories that were supposed to require repetition could be formed with just one trial. Somehow, I think your question of time of the day might be related to motivation. So there are some times of the day where the animals are more motivated to go out for foraging. We know that peaks of foraging occur early in the morning, typically, at least in European landscape, and in the afternoon, so around four or five, and then that's it. There is a no, no or less activity at noon and so on, for many reasons. But so, and, and, and probably the motivation varies with time of the day, and in consequence, learning actually might also learn. We might need actually a control experiment doing the same learning protocol at different times of the day and showing that. That would be great actually. Uh, and that would be the precise answer to your question. We need to do it. Okay. Uh, the third question is from Amanda Guerrero. Uh, she a quest, does the difference of bee casts, so uh, foragers or nurses, have a different capacity of long-term memory? Uh, yeah, so um, there are, uh, thanks Amanda for the question. There are different, different things here. Um, if we speak about workers, okay, and we have actually um, different kinds of workers, as you say, nurses and so on, but they are all workers, okay? Uh, the answer is yes, there will be differences, again, for the same reason uh, that I mentioned to Pedro, that these different groups of bees do not have the same motivation to respond to sugar. The protocol uses sugar as reward, and obviously the bees that would be the best ones in this protocol are the forager bees, the older bees. If you would use a nurse, it might respond to sugar, but the motivation would be not be not be so spectacular and it might learn of course but at a lower level memory would be not so good and things like that again we are hitting on the motivational point okay this is why uh, the experiments on the dopamine system were so important for us uh, so the answer would be yes i mean it would be var it, it would vary simply because the motivation of the animals might vary now you might ask actually you you might extend your question what about queens what about drones, workers, okay? And, and, and this is something interesting. First of all, there are practically no experiments on queens for a simple reason, because they are too expensive. So if you use, I mean, if you want to do one of these learning experiments, you need at least 30, 40 individuals to get proper statistics. Having actual experiment with 30, 40 queens, you kill your full apiary. <laughs> and there's no way you can do it, okay? So, um, 
And for drones, it's interesting because this is prejudice. Prejudice actually stopped for a while investigating the learning capacity of drones. Why? Because people say, look, drones are essentially stupid. These guys do not fit by themselves. They need to be fed by the workers. They are useless. The only thing for which they are good is just to copulate with the queen. So I mean, this should be like nonsense guys. Mistake, because when uh, some one of my former collaborators, Jean-Christophe Sandoz, did some experiments on drone learning, he showed they could learn, okay? So of course, not so good as foragers again, but they could learn, they were not so stupid. So we have some partial answers. We need to explore a little bit more. Uh, another question I got a, a now <laughs> from Giovanni Propta. Are there any results comparing the cognitive or learning on social bees versus solitary bees? Oh, that's a very nice question. And we would love to do that. The problem, Giovanni, for doing these experiments, uh, you might have seen actually that for these experiments, you require big sample size, having lots of bees and so on, regular access to bees. And you can do that with honeybees, uh, of course, uh, because I mean, we have hives and so on. Uh, you can do it also more and more with bumblebees because you can buy the little colonies and so on, but uh, reaching the same level of sample size and of course having established raising methods to access animals on a regular basis for solitary bees, it's difficult, as you might know. So, I mean, we are suffering from the fact that we do not have right now proper massive raising methods. I mean, we can raise them in little these hotels for solitary bees and things like that, but this is different from having access to 45, I don't know, osmias or, or, or 50 for one experiment, then you need to do a second experiment and so on. So, um, this is something, and though it's a very interesting question because this is what will allow you to answer the fundamental question of what sociality brings to cognition, okay? Is a solitary animal less cognitive, yes or no? And uh, there are some experiments on osmias and things like that, but I mean, uh, still at the beginning, we need to do more on that, definitely. Uh, now from Kevin Luce, are there works about the influence of dopamine in the mating and laying behavior of the honeybee queens? No, not that I know, Kevin, not that I know. Uh, so, um, no, I mean, what would be the relationship? Uh, I would see it in a different context, Kevin. I would say, for instance, my, my goal, uh, if you speak about this, would be to see if dopamine is activated in drones when they go chasing a female for copulation. Because if there is a wanting system there, this time in a context of copulation and, and mating, why not thinking that it might also be activated in the drones chasing a queen? Uh, in this case, I would see it more clearly. And uh, well, that's a great experiment to do, by the way. So why not? So yeah, about the, the, the specific points you mentioned, I don't know. Uh, and the last one is from Arturo Roque Justino. Uh, a really nice talk. Thank you. Is Thanks, there Arthur. any... <laughs> is there any difference in PER responsive <clears throat> sorry responsiveness when comparing nurses and foragers? Does the wanting system of B change as they age? Very good question. The first part I think I answered already. I think it was to to Amanda. I mean, when I answered the question of Amanda. Because yes, actually, uh, given that uh, they have a different kind of relationship to the sucrose reward, I mean, there are differences in sucrose responsiveness. There are even differences within foragers. So you have, for instance, two, broadly speaking, two big categories of foragers, pollen foragers and nectar foragers. And these two groups also show differences in the way they respond to sucrose but not the way you might imagine that. 
because I guess you're thinking, oh yeah, so nectar foragers are the ones responding more to sucrose. Well, no, it's the other way around. You say, what? No, it has, it has a meaning, it, it has a logic because actually pollen foragers respond to any kind of sucrose solution, even the very diluted ones. And so they are highly responsive to sucrose solution, although they go for pollen. Nectar foragers are less responsible. Why? Just because they respond only to the very concentrated sucrose solution. Makes sense. These guys for, go for nectar and they would not pay attention to bad nectar. They would pay attention only to very concentrated. So the answer is yes to the first part of the question. Now, the second part of the question, it's a very nice one. Does the wanting system of bees change as they age? I don't know. <laughs> I would love to do that. I mean, uh, I would love to have a control which can be done. We can control the age actually of bees and, and also relate to task they are doing if the wanted system changes, yes and no. I mean, because it, it might change for sucrose, but the animals are doing other things at different ages. Like the example of the drones going for, for the queen actually. Perhaps the wanting system does not change because it is applied for other goals. But I don't know. It's a very nice experiment to do. So uh, that was the last question. So uh, thank you once again very much, Dr. Martin, uh, for the great talk. The talk was amazing. I think it will uh, influence a lot of our people. Então, é... agora vou falar, agora, agora posso falar em português. Então, a primeira yes. coisa, muito, obriga muito obrigado a vocês pela invitação. Uh, <risos> vou, uh, eu fico muito agradecido a vocês pe pela invitação. Uh, meu, meu porto something, portunhol, porto inglês, não dá para fazer a palestra em, 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 em português, mas muito obrigado a vocês pela atenção. <risos> No. And uh, we, we would like to remember that we will have one last talk and that this talk that we have, this is Carabelle talk with Martin that we had, we will stay in our YouTube channel. So 7 of December, we are going to have our last talk with Gary Hartman. Um, thank you very much once again, Martin, and we will see you. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone.